My name is Rashid Smaila, and I'm a professor and Canada Research Chair in Interdisciplinary Oceans and Fisheries Economics. If you think of the relationship between people and the ocean, all the good stuff we take from the ocean, the fish, the oil, we do what we do with that, and we produce waste which we pump into the ocean. Because the ocean is so vast and large, doesn't mean we cannot mess it up. Being large doesn't also mean that we cannot protect it. We have communities and cultures that can be brought together to really help us manage it. How do you take these resources and use them to benefit as many people as possible? This is not only a source of food and recreation, it's simply a source of life. The oceans are our life. Welcome to the Blue Hour. I'm Farha Guerrero. Tonight I speak with Rashid Sumela, who learned early in life about the importance of being environmentally conscious. His grandfather used to tell him that people should walk as if the earth feels pain. Rashid Sumela is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Interdisciplinary Ocean and Fisheries Economics at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. He wakes up each day thinking about how to ensure that we bequeath a healthy ocean to our children and grandchildren. His latest book, Infinity Fish, is a wonderful testament to this grand idea. But first, let's start the night with his music choice. This one comes from his son, Haske, who has composed this song titled Seafoam. Rashid Sumaila, thank you so much for joining me today. We just listened to your son's song, a beautiful piece called Sea Foam. It's, I think it will resonate a lot with what we're going to talk about today because we are going to be talking about the oceans. 
Yeah, you know, uh, I, what I can say about starting with my son is uh, is, is an amazing young man. Uh, uh, he just finished UBC. He, 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 he did integrated engineering and actually is working. He's working with an aerospace uh, company here in Vancouver. Uh, since the beginning, he's been talented. He loved music. He had his guitar. He would just sit down and compose things on his own. It's a person who writes well, he likes math, so he's that kind of lucky person, if we like. So he, he keeps making this music. And so when this opportunity came, I said, Hey, do you have any any anything you can share that we can we can use? Send me something and I'll send to Farha and see what she thinks. And you love this particular one, C form, which actually rhymes with our issues because the ocean and the sea. Is what I spend uh, my academic work, my academic life on looking at that. So, so it's just fit for purpose here. One, it wonderfully fit, and I want to congratulate you on receiving a wonderful award. And you've received many, but this one is the Killam Professorship at UBC, which is an extraordinary award, and you received it earlier this year. And so, congratulations on that. How does it feel to be recognized as a Killam Professor? Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, for doing this and getting some ideas and some of my thoughts out to a larger audience. And uh, the Killam University Professorship is, is quite special. I mean, you win awards, you win some that are national, that are international, but this is actually a UBC award, which recognizes you are recognized by your peers. Uh, and this is the highest award UBC can give anyone. So, so this is especially special to me, really. I mean, and and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, I thank the jury and everybody involved. This is remarkable, actually. It is, and and then I think it really recognizes all of the you know the decades of work that you have been doing at the university. And speaking of which, we spoke at the university at UBC uh, about. Just just under a decade ago, uh, way back in 2012, you came yeah. to the CITR studio. Um, and coincidentally, it was the same year that you had attended a conference in uh, Namibia um, mm. about how to help sustain Africa's uh, marine fisheries. Yeah. And that conference has inspired a recent book of yours, a book that you just published uh, called Infinity Fish, which I hope we can talk about today. But maybe you can just bring us and sort of fast forward the time that we, since we've spoken, what, what you've been doing, what you've been busy with during the last decade. Yeah, so, so really, thank you for that interview. You know what? I, I really value and appreciate the relationship between me as an academic scientist and, and journalist and people who do science journalism like you, because really there's no point just publishing your papers and leaving them in the journals for colleagues. You got to get the information out. And I think that interview you did with me was part of this. So you are part of the reason I actually got selected and, and won the, the University of Kielan Prize. So thank you for your, your inputs in this. Now, in 2012, I, I got invited to Namibia to give a talk. It was a national fisheries conference. And, uh, and and two other African ministers were invited from uh, the seashells and from Sierra Leone. So they were sitting. I land in the country. I didn't quite understand the politics that was going on, right? But I always knew that in Namibia, diamonds and, and fish are really important to the economy. I think each of them separately contributes at least about 10% to the national GDP, the gross domestic product. So so it's really important. So I go in there and and I part of my talk, I, I told them, look, I am here to convince you that fish is more valuable than diamonds. And the room kind of just went into, it was amazing to see the reaction from the room, right? Half of the room, the Minister of Fisheries, they were all so happy, you could see on their faces. And the diamond people were in there, they didn't like it, obviously. I was turning the, the what they believe was more valuable on its head. And, and how did I explain this? Simply, I had two reasons. I said, look here, if you, if you look at fish, Fish, if you manage it well, effectively, it can continue to give you benefit through time because it's renewable, right? You can keep coming each year for some fish to feed your family, 
to do your basic economic stuff, you know? So, and mathematically, anything that can give you a benefit to infinity, when you sum the benefit, is going to be infinity. So, infinity fish, you know? That is where the title of my book came from. On the other hand, when you think of diamond, really, when you dig a ton of diamond, you cannot come back next year and dig that same ton. It's gone forever. So, so that one is actually not forever, as people tell us in, in popular palace, right? You dig it, it's gone. I mean, you can tell me you you could you can save the benefits and 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 earn money in the stock market, but but I know that governments don't don't they are always running deficits, so that doesn't hold water either. Now, my second point is that fish is really uh everybody's uh, valuable thing in the sense that if you have a room full of people like i had in namibia you ask them how many of you have eaten fish in the last week in the last week you're going to get a huge proportion in namibia that will be virtually everybody raising their hand right now ask people how many of you have seen diamond in your life and there will be virtually nobody in the room right so diamond is an elitist commodity. A few people mind it, they make the money, they run off with it. But fish, every coastal person can just go get, feed your family. So it is more the people's valuable thing and therefore it's more valuable than diamond. And the room went ballistic. It was amazing to see the reaction. And since then, I've been building this story, looking at valuation, how we value our oceans, how we value natural resources, our environment, how comprehensive it is. And if you look at it in the book, you see that actually we only care, we care mostly just about what we can sell, but the values are bigger than that. You just have to ask our uh, indigenous population in BC, the First Nations Fisheries Council, whom I collaborate with. The value of a salmon to the First Nation is far larger than, than just what the price you get in the market. So when you do all this properly, you get to infinity fish, where you can pass on a healthy ocean with solid, sustainable, healthy fish stocks to your children and grandchildren. And then you give them the opportunity to do the same to their own. And this can go on to infinity. And then we have infinity fish. So that is the idea behind the book. And it all started in the what I call, and many people do, the mother of all continents, Africa. And, and I gave a talk about this in the US. And I said, you know what? The room was full. I, I talked about the new book. And I say, you know what? You are all Africans. You don't even realize that the room just went ballistic, right? <laughs> so that's where everything started with people, human beings, and so. No, it's absolutely wonderful, Rashid. And I just love how you said this idea that over the last, you know, decade since we spoke, um, you've been weaving together more of this story, right? And I think yeah. my feeling is now that I'm talking to you, I'm seeing more of the story coming together in many beautiful ways. And isn't that wonderful to say that as an economist, right? Because in the end, even if you're an economist or a scientist or a First Nations person, um, as you've said, all, all of you have something important in this story and something to contribute. And that leads me to my next um, question. You, over in the more recent past, are now starting to consider yourself more as an interdisciplinary oceans and fisheries economist, right? Hmm. So this idea that all of these big global issues, which we'll hear about today, are cannot be solved by one discipline, that there needs to be much more interaction and really a solidarity that's beyond, you know, just what might be happening at conferences, right, or, or on the Absolutely. government tables. And so talk about that and talk about also your wish to launch a kind of future sub-discipline where you will collaborate more or, you know, academically. Um, and as you said, uh, even, you know, with First Nations groups that will that might tie into values that might not reach into academia. So, for example, spiritual, cultural values. How do you plan to, to launch something like that? And how do you see yourself in the future as this interdisciplinary economist? 
Yeah, I describe myself as an interdisciplinary oceans and fisheries economist. And uh, to really see how I evolve and why I evolved to this, I would like to take my listeners through, just follow me a bit for a few minutes and, and see. So, so to start with, just think of our relationship with the environment in general and, and with the ocean in particular. If you go down to the basics, what do we people do with or to the environment, to the ocean? I think we do basically two things. So we go to the ocean, we take the stuff we need, the stuff we desire, the stuff we want, e.g. the fish. We take them into our economy and we do all the stuff people do with, 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 with fish. It's cultural, it's food, it's nutrition, it's social, you know. It's economics. That is what we do. And when we do all these things, what do we produce at the end? We produce waste. You pump out CO2 whilst you are running around trying to catch your fish with your trawler, right? Bottom trawler. And, and then, or, 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 or you, you end up leaving some of your fishing gear and it becomes plastic in the ocean and kills animals, right? So from the ocean, good things come, such as the fish we need, we want, and bad things go. So for us to really do this wisely and not to end up with a dead ocean, you know, we can end up with a dead ocean. For us to avoid that, we need to understand the ecology of the ocean, the biophysics of the ocean, all the natural sciences. And when we get into the economy, even before how we catch the fish, the people's side, which is all our spiritual values, our cultural values, our economics, our social systems, cultural, indigenous people, non-indigenous people, all the, 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 the societal stuff, right? And then the pumping out, we need to understand how to do this. So you need to reduce CO2. You, you, people are developing green chemistry, right? To avoid all the toxins coming out. And as you see me paint this picture, you can see straight away that no single discipline can actually handle all this since we got to work together. Not even economists. I like to say this when I'm in a room full of economists. We need everybody. We need all perspective. In fact, we don't need just scientists. We need non-scientists. And I had the privilege of uh, uh, getting a SHIRK partnership uh, grant about six years ago, my partnership grant that I call the Ocean Canada Partnership. And, and that was really the place where I, I played around with my colleagues and a large group where we demonstrated how to do this, essentially, using Canada's TRICOS as a laboratory. And, and this has actually, we've, we've, we've come so far and done so well that only yesterday, was it? On the 30th of November, actually, the Czech announced there are five impact award winners and and I, I was one of them for the partnership grant because of the way we brought people together we had 22 partners over 100 people lots of students i love students and postdocs because that's the future and we worked for six years we have the dfo the government we had the post vancouver ports uh, authority here as part of the we have first nations we have fish not NGOs, and we work together to look at right from the ecology through to the economics to the cultural side to try to understand the future of Canada's oceans. For example, the Arctic is going to see most likely more fish, different type of fish coming. So commercial fishes may begin to be interested because they see the potential. But what happens to our First Nations communities who have been living there for centuries, right? Living there they are active, low energy life, meeting their needs, doing ice fishing, and suddenly you have trawlers coming in. What does it mean, right? And you can't, under, I alone can't understand this. No way I need a team. And so that is that is where we are. And I'm taking this forward into the future. And, and I also believe many of our students on this project, they are, some of them are professors already. And so we are going to propagate this and hopefully my next book, I'm going to write about interdisciplinary ocean and fisheries economics. Uh, so hopefully even to launch a sub a subdiscipline in that sense. 
You know what? What's amazing listening to you, Rashid, is at one glance, you know, one might think maybe you're not an economist. <laughs> you might sound like a scientist, right? Or yeah, yeah. you might be one of these other people that you've mentioned in this big story. And I think yeah. that's wonderful because I don't feel that you wear any one particular hat. And, yeah. and yet you are an economist. And yeah. the difference also with you is that you and, and like many economists around the world, you're looking at something that's actually that includes the entire ocean, which is quite yeah. phenomenal. I mean, you've yeah. said, you know, the ocean is not just our livelihood and 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 what how we can depend on it it's life it's we 50 of our oxygen um yeah. you've said this many times comes from yeah. the ocean 60 uh, percent of people around the world live near a, you know some sort of coastline and depend on the ocean and you've even said that even those people that recreate on the ocean so the surfers they the recreational yeah. fishermen the snorkelers the divers yeah. They're yeah. important too. I see the ocean as as we have one ocean, uh, technically, right? Because they are connected. We bring them into the Atlantic, the Pacific, to make it easier for us to deal with them. But essentially, they are all connected. And I think the ocean, for me, is a symbol of our world, actually. And I, I really think that for, for the world to be healthy, for environmentally, socially, economically, we really have to think at this level. We have to understand that none of us, no part of the world can truly be safe and peaceful and well to do without the rest of the world being the same. So ultimately, if I were to set an agenda for the world, citizens of the world, all of us should aim to work to really ensure that Life is livable for all human beings. Not only for all human beings, but life is also sustainable for nature because really the two have to work together for this to work. You, you cannot just say, only me, 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 only people, only people. It, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help you. And we see it with COVID, right? And, and these are all connected, COVID-19, right? Some of us feel, oh, the way to deal with this is to close our own borders and protect ourselves. It's not going to work. We have to get control of this virus all over the world, and then we are all safe. And, and I, that is the way that I see the world. And so the ocean gives me that ability to actually do this because it's everywhere, right? It's 70% of the world. Whether you like it or not, you're connected to the ocean. Gives us the oxygen, oxygen, it modifies the temperature, and, and so on and so forth. And when the when the when the when the climate, when the weather is messed up, it's not nature that feels the pain, it's we the people who feel the pain. And in Vancouver, in BC, we've seen it this year. From the heat, from the wildfires, and now floods. I mean, you see a city being bent down, you see Towns becoming rivers suddenly. I mean, it just breaks your heart. So we need to really lift off. You know, people say, uh, think globally and act loca locally. I really think we have to think and act both locally and globally, both locally and regionally, both locally and nationally. That is where we have to be. I know it's not easy, but I really think that is when we will start to have a sustainable, equitable, sustainable world for all. All the management strategies that we have today were really developed thousands of years ago by the Pacific Islanders. Things like closed areas, closed seasons for spawning, minimum size limits. Somebody would say like, oh, he's a fisherman. Is he a good fisherman? And the definition of a good fisherman is not somebody who goes out there and harvests everything, but a successful fisherman is somebody who goes out there and takes care of the ocean while harvesting from the ocean. In the years since the rise of global commercial fishing, 90% of fish stocks have been fished at or above their maximum sustainable yield, proving a desperate need for global, sustainable fishery management. 
For years, we've been puzzling over the problem of showing people what's happening way offshore, out of sight, or underneath the surface of the water. And we stumbled across a system of radio frequency broadcasts that can be intercepted by satellites to take all of the commercial fishing activity in the ocean and put it on a map for everybody to see. Strengthened by satellite-assisted monitoring, international partnerships have grown, sharing data on shared fish stocks. Before we were acting individually, we were not seeing, we were not knowing. Now, the only way you can fish in our EZ is to be compliant, be legal, and then we can cooperate in a sustainable fishing. Following in the footsteps of successful regional partnerships, shared management of shared fish stocks went global with the ratification of the Port State Measures Agreement by 36 parties covering 62 countries and the partnerships of the Safe Ocean Network. Agreeing shared frameworks for global fishery management, rewarding the good fishermen, and taking bold collective steps forward toward the rhythms of our sustainable past. We in the West are just starting to realize the frailty and, and the finiteness of, of the ocean. When you decide that this is your priority, it must be reflected throughout the system. It's our life. The ocean is our life. The other thing about your book, Infinity Fish, is this idea about future generations. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? A healthy ocean, you know, means future generations having that healthy ocean. Wonderful. Yeah, that's good. I mean, yeah, you, you reminded me. Before I get to that, I wanted to pick up on fish, no, no boundaries, right? <laughs> they go where they go. I I, I make a, a jokes when I give talks. And, and, and they, they, you know, our jokes are not just jokes, right? They, they mean something. Uh, I was talking in, in London and there, there were really, there was a big debate on Brexit. And I, I just said, you know what, guys? The fish, they don't care whether you Brexit or no Brexit, right? French fish go where they go. British fish go where they go, right? The same thing I do with, uh, with uh, what I'm in the U.S. Mexican fish, no wall can stop them. They go, right? So, so and this is really important. The first time I said this was when I, I, I was part of the movie, End of the Line. I'm sure many listeners will know this. Uh, it's been described as the inconvenient truth of the ocean. If you haven't seen this, I think it's worth looking. The first real science-based movie about the ocean. And I, I had a few, a few minutes in there. And I was interviewed. I was taken to the... A port in Senegal, and we, we, we went following a trawler, seeing all the discards and so on. And and I, I was interviewing, and I said, you know what? You know what? Fish from Namibia, from Senegal, right? Within 10 hours, some of them get to the markets in Europe straight away. They get visa to go straight away. But Africans cannot get visa to go to, to, go to Europe. I mean, so, so, yeah, this is the thing about fish, wild fish whether freshwater or ocean fisheries, naturally given to us, very valuable, right? And and I my point of the departure is that we the current generation has no right to deprive the future nations of this same bounty, right? So so when we manage the fisheries, we are managing it on our behalf and on the behalf of those to come after us. If you ask my granddaughter uh, future granddaughter, the, how to handle fish. I think, for example, she could tell you that, look, leave the fish in there until I come I come into the scene, and, until I, I'm, I'm here to also enjoy it. And if you ask somebody now, they will want to take take the fish now. So, so then you have to find a balance. And that led me and my colleagues to develop what we call intergenerational discounting approach that is a way to value future fish in ways 
that does not diminish the, 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 the fish of our grandchildren. We give them equal weight at the minimum, right? So that is the, the idea. There. And this idea actually connects very nicely to indigenous thinking. I think in, 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 in BC here in Canada, uh, indigenous people have this idea of seventh generation thinking where, where the, what guides them is that they are not managing this only for their generation, but for the seventh generation. So think about infinity fish thinking, right? So so that is uh, central. And, and we need to do this for our environment. This connects to climate change, right? If we blow up things and make now, because we don't want to adjust, we don't want to take any action because we think it's costly, and we hand over to our grandchildren a terrible uh, environment where they, they have to live with extreme weather. The kind of one we've seen here in BC, if it repeats more often, more frequent, can you imagine how life will be here? So yes, the, 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 the future generation are crucial in our thinking if we're going to have uh, a sustainable world. And actually that thinking is also good for us because all the things we need to do to ensure future generations have the fish and the environment they need are the things we need to do to ensure that we continue to have it too, right? So, so this is not only uh, being nice to future generations, it's actually being nice to ourselves too. Now, you and your team, you offer many wonderful solutions, not just to overfishing, but but also to calculating these kind of parameters of, of what the value that we put on fish stocks. You're, you're capturing the smaller fishing communities and the smaller communities as much as the bigger ones as well. Um, yeah. But you've also had, you've, you know, over the years, you've presented some quite big ideas. Um, and I think we should talk about that. You know, the yeah. idea of, of the high seas being a kind of savings bank. Yeah, you know, the, the high seas. You know, what we have done, man, people, I mean, through the UN system, actually, in this case, was is to split the ocean into two parts. The first one is what we call exclusive economic zones of coastal countries. And so for Canada, when you're on the Pacific coast, when you go 200 nautical miles into the ocean, that is considered the exclusive economic zone of Canada. And Canada has the right, mandated through the UN system, to manage and control. No country can just come in into that area and fish. So these are country waters, essentially. And countries, to different degrees, are successful or not in managing that. So that's that. But at least we know it's under the control of countries. Now, the high seas are the areas beyond these 200 nautical miles. And it's a large part of the ocean. It's actually two thirds of the ocean. Now, most of the productive parts of the ocean are within the 200 nautical miles around the continental shelves of countries as the most productive. The high seas are not very productive. They contain fish that are very special. Some of them live very long. I mean, some of, some of them live longer than people, over 100 years and so on, Alfonsino and, and uh, Orange Ruffy and the like. So they are slow growing. And, and so they are almost like the diamonds I talked about. So when you fish them, you are essentially mining them. And that is not good for biodiversity. And it's not a lot. So now there is a lot of fish that go in and out of the high seas and country waters, like the tunas, right? The highly migratory stocks. This is why high seas fishing is popular in, for some countries. But again, it's two thirds of the ocean. And we take about five, eight, ten percent maximum of the total catch out of the high seas, which is two thirds of the ocean. So here in comes economics. I was just sitting and thinking about this. And I say, look here, this is two thirds of the ocean. We catch five percent of the total catch. It's a large area. So even without doing any deep analysis, you just think about it. Boats running around all this big area just to catch 5% of fish that actually do spend time in country waters. They pump CO2. They disturb this long-living species for not much money or jobs. So, hey, 
this thing doesn't make sense. This was where the idea to close the high seas to fishing and turn it into a fish bank came to me. So I started talking with my colleagues and this has led to several papers, right? And we, I say, give the, the fish that go in and out. When they go in there, they get the piece, they get the break, they grow well, they enjoy their freedom. They are like people actually. They lay more eggs. The eggs fly into the country is a juvenile fish move over, even adults. We catch them cheaply without pumping out CO2 too much. Just think of all the benefits. And what is more, at the moment, only around eight countries take 80% of the catch in the high seas, the big rich countries, right? We're talking about China. We're talking about Korea, Taiwan, Spain, right? They are those fish in there. But if we turn this into a fish bank, small countries, developing countries, where people really need the fish to eat, will be able to catch them too. And historically, this has been the case. So it's such a beautiful idea, right? You, leave, you give the fish a break, we get better biodiversity, we get better economies, and we also get better distribution of benefits. It's wonderful. I mean, I just love this idea. And slowly it's catching up. In fact, since we started talking about this, people thought I was crazy in the beginning. I kept pushing. And now we got our first large uh, uh, high, seas, uh, high seas close area in the Ross Sea in Antarctica. And I think more are to come because more and more people are seeing the social, economic, and biodiversity and climate benefits, by the way. So that is the idea. And it's just wonderful. I love it. The day we do this, I can I can actually retire. You know, I'll be so happy. Yeah. And we know around the world with marine protected areas. So even when governments, countries, populations protect very small pieces of the ocean, you know, on coastal areas, you see dramatic changes. Uh, you see the fish, the coral, the the health of the oceans come back in these little pockets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, our calculations show that we will be catching more fish overall if we did that than what we are catching now. So there you go. So the spillover is going to give more, more, more fish on your table than now. So, yeah, you're right. Well, you mentioned the documentary, End of the Line. End of the Line, uh, yeah. I myself, when I was a high school student, I went on oh. an exchange. It was a government exchange. Um, and this was in 1994 to go to Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. I had witnessed firsthand as a young person the, the devastating effects of that collapse of the cod fishery. Oh. Let's listen now to a clip from the documentary End of the Line, produced in 2009. This one covers the collapse of the cod fisheries in Newfoundland in the 1990s. We never used to think about where our fish came from, but in fact, they are wild animals. And we found that out to our cost for the first time in Newfoundland. For centuries, the waters in northern Canada teemed with unbelievable amounts of codfish. Legend had it that you could walk across their backs on the water. The cod was so plentiful, the communities thrived on fishing. As the years went on, technology improved. The boats got bigger and catches increased. The bounty seemed endless. Then, in 1992, the unthinkable happened. In St. John's tonight, angry fishermen vented their rage. They charged the room where John Crosby was holding a news conference, but security would not let them in. What had once been the most abundant cod population in the world had been fished out of existence. I've decided that effective at midnight tonight, there will be a moratorium and harvesting of northern cod until the spring of 1994. Either we cooperate in addressing it, or there's going to be no fish for anybody. No fish for the Europeans, no fish for the Canadians, 
and an ecological catastrophe on our hands. With or without you, no, gonna... with or without you, You're and gonna... not only me, every fisherman in this island, we're going fishing. Overnight, 40,000 people lost their jobs. The cod is gone, and I think within the context of cod, particularly in the Canadian perspective, is that this is a species that has been fished for centuries and centuries. Cod was the reason that people migrated from the UK, from Europe, northern France in particular, to Canada. It was because of cod. The fishing ban brought the people to the streets. They hoped that one day the cod would return. The significance didn't drop, didn't dawn on anybody, till much later. Today, there are uh, so few left that they're, uh, they've got endangered status in Canada, and the cod populations have not rebounded despite a moratorium on cod fishing since 1992. In 2007, this research vessel set two lines, each with 1,500 hooks, to find out how many cod were left in the waters off eastern Canada. On the first line, they caught one small codfish. On the second, a small basketful. The cod stocks had been depleted to such a low level that they were unable to recover. For Newfoundland, for a community for which the whole reason for its existence was cod, there's this historical ingrained element. It's part of society, permeates society, and the loss of the fish was basically akin to sort of a loss of soul, and it still remains that 15 years later. My sense is, Rashid, you are positive. You, you got an optimistic outlook. And how do you keep that optimism? I mean, I think even the title of your book, Infinity Fish, I think that's yeah. quite optimistic. Um, you know, we can find solutions. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I am optimistic. I remain optimistic. Actually, I, I believe I have no option but to be optimistic because, come on, what does it mean not to be optimistic? To give up? To stop trying, oh, no way. So, so to be optimistic is the way to go. And, and actually, if we look back, if we look back in history, optimists have actually helped the world in so many ways. You know, there are all the negatives, but if you look to society, has made some progress. I mean, whether you are talking about uh, uh, human rights, whether you are talking about civil rights or gender imbalance, you know, so so. So I like to remain hopeful, and and actually I I also say that if I little Rashid I like to call myself little Rashid if I give up now what would somebody like Nelson Mandela looking up from his grave say about me I mean what have you seen Rashid right why are you remain optimistic keep doing it that is the only way we can improve our world because that's all that we have. One of your heroes is a man named Wassily Leontiev, and he was the Nobel Prize winner in 1973 in economics research, but he's also the creator of the input-output technique, a method that provides tools uh, for a systematic analysis of the complicated inter-industry uh, transactions in an economy. And so I thought it'd be nice just to listen to him. And this is, this is a piece from the archives. In 1973, the United Nations came to me and asked to help 
what a report how one could help less developed countries. I said, I have to construct an input-output table of the entire world. We opened their eyes. And since the United Nations received money for that from Holland, because Dutch are always very good subsidizing progressive research. So they told me, go ahead to Holland and explain to Dutch. So I went there and explained people in the foreign ministry what I want to do. It, we were very surprised, but I suppose we decided, why not? And I made a study. I made, it was called the future of a world economy, which was translated in 13 languages. And what I did, this type of approach you can use to project alternative paths to the future, naturally. And I projected several alternative paths. And one of them was to see how much assistance less developed countries would need in order to be able at least not to fall back, but slowly catch up with the developed countries. I made also a big study on arms spending and the whole production of arms, use of arms. You can introduce it in input-output table. It is quite clear when one can ask ourselves, imagine we reduce production of arms and some of them resources, which we say can use for helping less developed countries. Why was Wasi the Leonti of important to you, Rashid? Yeah, yeah there, there are a number of reasons. And, and, and the, the clip actually says a lot already. Uh, one of the things I like doing is reading uh, about scientists uh, uh, that have really made uh, big contributions. So so I used to uh, go to the office and I do what I call random reading. So I just pick on scientists and read their background. And he, so he, his background actually struck me when I read it. You know, Leontiev is a Russian, born in Russia. He started doing his economic work, but he did large scale things like what he just described. So he'll put the whole economy on a piece of paper and say, what does this economy generate? What are, what are the out, outputs that it generates? What are the inputs that it takes in in order to produce this? That's the input output table, right? Just put them on, 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 on the sheet, see what goes in here, how much, what, that's what he was describing, right? So putting out that framework. And he started doing this when he was in Russia. And, and from my reading, actually, he got into a lot of trouble in Russia because they said he's bringing economic thinking, huh? communist place and so on. Right? So, and in Russia, it wasn't even fellow scientists who were going after him. It was actually the government institutions. And it's hard for an individual to fight the government. So at the end of the day, he migrated to the U.S. and continued doing his work. But you know what happened in the U.S. too? They went after him, saying he's bringing all this planning from the communist system to a market system. But in the U.S., the good thing, it was his peers, his fellow scientists, who didn't agree were going on, and he could just ignore them, keep doing his way. So this is one of the reasons why I really love him. He kept on doing his thing. You see the U.N. ask him to come. He uses theoretical framework to actually do something real. Uh, what will it? What benefits would the world get if we just reduce some of the ridiculous amounts we are using into arms and turn it into making people's lives livable in the world, right? And, and it's so beautiful work. And he takes the whole world. That that is another reason I, I like this piece of work because it just connects with me. My deep notion that really, at the end of the day, citizens of the world have to just make sure that. The basic needs of everybody is met in a sustainable way. 
have to be do this, otherwise we are in trouble. You, 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 you talked about the Newfoundland example, right? People were banging on the door. If we use a fraction of the resources that had to be used just to make people to, 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 to stop the rioting, if you like, the, the protest, that would have saved the fish and the people, right? Think of this globally. We are, we are employing about, about 260 million people draw their income from from fisheries if we let this go most of these people are in large developing countries the kind of countries uh Lienthof was trying to help through the un right you are talking about china vietnam you are talking about nigeria right huge countries i i gave a talk in 2016 uh, uh, at the state department where all this uh, in fact obama talked before before i came i i gave my talk and, and i said if the fish goes all this millions of young people in, in developing countries is big issues, not only for the countries, but for the world. You have forced migration, you have all the issues. So, hey, we got to do something to keep our fish going, make them infinity fish, and, and we'll all have peace. You know? So this is why I, I really admire Leonti of his perseverance, his ability to see the world and do something scientifically that leads to practical solutions on the ground. That's beautiful science as far as I'm concerned. And we didn't get to fish subsidies. Fish subsidies can actually have detrimental effects on, on societies, um, and especially on these smaller communities, these fishing yeah. communities. Yeah, subsidies is one of the things I've actually spent time, me and my collaborators and students, actually two decades. I mean, we've been trying to we build database of subsidies, we update them year in, year out. And actually, many countries that are negotiating right now, if I should have been in Geneva now, where the ministerial meeting was supposed to take place from November 30 to December 3rd, and we're expecting the world to have an agreement to take out what we call harmful overfishing subsidies. Either redirect them, and this goes to your future thinking. Remember, subsidies are not all bad, like most things, right? It's what we do with our public funds, you know. So, so the reason many of us, and I, I just led a group of nearly 300 scientists to do a, a, a letter, an open letter that was published in Science addressed to WTO members where we argued for why these this, this subsidies have to go or be redirected. And, and, and so it's the bad subsidies that well, the fuel subsidies that makes people overfish and fish more than they would, those kind of things. Or you buy engines for people to go fish. It, it just artificially increases their profit, and so they fish more. And, and in my book, there is a chapter there on subsidies. And the thing is, what I say is, if you keep giving harmful subsidies, you can forget infinity fish because it's, it helps to take down the resources that we need, the fish itself, that we need to ensure this. So you have the environmental problems with bad subsidies. But what we have seen again and again is that it has social uh, implications. So, so they sabotage the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, 17 goals that are supposed to move the world towards actually infinity existence, not just fish. And, and, and they do this because about 80% of all the subsidies that are given by countries of the world, and that is $35 billion a year, and this is an industry you can generously estimate as a $100 billion uh, revenue generating industry, the, the, the ocean fisheries, right? So that's 35% of the gross revenue of this inter industry is subsidies. Just think about that. That leads to more, more fishing. Now, 20% of that, only 20% goes to small scale coastal fisheries. These are the people we need to really support because fish means their livelihood, their lives, their, their nutrition, right? So we give 80% to the large-scale industrial fishing boats that go all over the world, take the fish and move on. And, and, and that's what we are doing. And this has implications for gender because most women who fish actually are small scale. So we, we, we kind of disadvantage them. To me, that is the craziest thing the world can do because women all over the place are already so disadvantaged socially, economically, legally, and 
otherwise, religiously, for example. So we shouldn't use our tax money to do so. We also disadvantage the youth, right? Young people don't start with big industrial boats, so we keep them out by doing this. So subsidies, the bad subsidies that lead to environmental degradation, social and fairness inequity, and, 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 and danger, uh, gender inequality aggravating it are things I think the world should stay far away from. Yeah. Divert these things, talking about the future, there are ideas like paying fishes who are used to being on the water, love being going out on the water. How about you pay them to fish for plastic, right? I wrote down for fish when it is overfished. So they clean the ocean of plastic. They give the fish a break. They make the ocean cleaner and therefore healthier, able to, to stand climate change. I mean, win, win, win. So we need to do clever, use our public funds cleverly, rather than just throwing them in as fuel subsidies, for example. So that is why there's so much to talk about this, I tell you. Uh, the paper I mentioned in science, I, together with my core team at UBC, we got 297 scientists from 255 institutions in all continents of the world except Antarctica to be part of this. So talk, talk about interdisciplinary global effort. That is a good example of that. And been wonderful to 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 see what you've been up to the last decade and i hope that we have another chance to, to speak again in the yeah. future yeah. and i just i wish you and your team the best of luck in all the things that you're doing and and i hope that, that the younger generation you know they can hear podcasts like this because they are the the future scientists yeah. the future economists the future policy makers that can make a difference I really need to give credit to 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 my my grandfather, my my parents actually, and, and my grandfather was one of those who who without me knowing actually put into us this idea that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. And and one of the things he used to tell us when we were jumping and playing and knocking all over with our soccer ball and how and and this old man will say, hey guys, you know the way you are you are jumping all over. You should remember, behave, do as if the F the surface the the, the F feels pain when you step on it. You don't just bang on the F. Just think as if it feels pain. And I think this was actually sophisticated environmentalism, which I realized only later in life. So I credit my, my people when I was growing up back in West Africa. Thank you. You have been tuned into an episode of The Blue Hour on CITR, the broadcasting voice of the University of British Columbia. Run by the Student Radio Society of UBC, CITR broadcasts over 100 locally focused radio programs in seven different languages, streamed online and available as podcasts. My name is Farha Guerrero. I'm the volunteer host and producer of The Blue Hour. You can download the Blue Hour podcast on CITR and also subscribe to them on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. You can also find a transcript of this interview on the hourisblue.ca. My guest today was Rashid Sumela. You can learn more about his work through the Institute of Oceans and Fisheries on their website at oceans.ubc.ca. We're going to end today's show with another song composed by Rashid's son, Haske. This one is titled Rose Garden. Thank you for listening tonight.